Um, my name is Professor Simon Noble. I am a Marie Curie professor in supportive and palliative care. I'm also one of the medical directors of Thrombosis UK and I've been asked to give a brief talk about cancer associated thrombosis. This talk is being given specifically with the intention that you are a patient or a carer um, and you've come to this talk uh, because either you or a loved one have had a clot at some point during their cancer journey and maybe looking for some answers, um, have questions. So I'm hoping I can give you a little bit of an overview. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start very much from the basics first, explain a little bit about clotting, explain why people with cancer get clots, why it's important that we treat them, then I'll take you through the treatments as well. So this isn't meant to be an academic talk. There's plenty of those on the internet. Um, if there's demand for such a thing, you know, I'd be happy to do one of those here. But this is meant very much for the patients. And a lot of what I'm going to say to you is similar to the sort of discussions I'll be having with my patients when they come and see me in the Cancer Associated Thrombosis Clinic. So let's talk about clotting first. Clotting is actually a normal part of our body's healing process. If I were to cut myself and I didn't have a clotting system, I would just continue to bleed until I had no blood left. If I have an operation, I'm very glad that I have a clotting system which helps all the um, blood vessels and all the areas of tissue that have been damaged, it helps them heal. In fact, what you would find if you looked at my body with a special microscope, you'd see that all the time I'm having spontaneous tiny little bleeds, but they come to nothing because my body clots and it'll form clots at these bleeding points and they don't get any worse. But as good as we are at making clots, we're also very good at reabsorbing clots when they don't, when they're no longer necessary. And this is something called plasmin, which is a bit like scissors, which come along and snip away at the clot and reabsorb it into the body when it's no longer needed. And it kind of makes sense that the body has that system because if you think about it, I've been on this planet 50 years now making blood clots. If I didn't have a system by which all my clots were reabsorbed, I'd just be full of clot now. So therefore, normal healthy person, the body is making clots and reabsorbing clots. And there's this sort of state of equilibrium which works very well. Now, sometimes that state of equilibrium goes wrong. Something will stop and upset that balance. And there are many things that can increase your risk of getting an abnormal clot. Um, there are other talks on this website which will tell you about those. We talk about inflammation of blood vessels. It increases the stickiness of the blood. We talk about damage to blood vessels or even something which slows blood flow um, and therefore makes blood sludge. But in cancer patients, the main culprit is that the cancer releases molecules into the blood that makes it more sticky. Now, not all cancers are the same. Cancers such as brain cancer, lung cancer, upper gastrointestinal cancer, so esophagus, stomach, pancreas, they make the blood very sticky indeed up to 20 fold more sticky, 20 fold more likely to get a clot. Cancers such as breast cancer or prostate cancer don't make the blood as sticky, but because they are such common cancers, I see a hell of a lot of prostate cancer and a hell of a lot of breast cancer patients coming through my clinic. The other things that increase your risk of clots in the cancer context are if the cancer has spread beyond its primary tumour. So what I mean is if the cancer has gone to lymph nodes or it's spread to other organs, so the liver, the brain, bones, um, anywhere around the body, these are called metastases. If the body has metastases, that can also increase the risk of clotting, perhaps 20-fold. And I think the way to understand that is it really means that you've got more tumour around the body creating clotting factors, 
or these abnormal factors which make the clotting system work more efficiently. And also, it may be that the cancer itself is more metabolically active. So you have a greater inflammatory process which drives clots. Now finally, the other thing that increases your risk of clots is various treatments for cancer. So surgery we know increases your risk of blood clots, but also chemotherapy can do that. Now just to illustrate this, if we think about breast cancer, which is one of the less clotty cancers. Now if you had an early stage breast cancer, so stage one or two, your risk of a clot is two per thousand, which is only double the national average. So healthy people have a risk of one in a thousand. So two per thousand. If you were to give that breast cancer patient something called adjuvant chemotherapy, and what that means is you've had your operation, they've removed the tumor, but they want to give chemotherapy to mop up any other blood cells and increase the likelihood that this cancer never comes back. If you were to have adjuvant chemotherapy, you would find that the risk of blood clots would increase tenfold. So it would go from two per thousand to two percent or two per hundred. Now to illustrate the impact of chemotherapy and cancer which has spread, if we look at a patient with stage four breast cancer, now that means breast cancer which has spread to other parts of the body, and we look at that person on chemotherapy, their risk of blood clots is 8%. So you can see there's a big difference in people who have chemotherapy for early stage disease and people who have chemotherapy for later stage disease. Now, the other thing that is important to recognise is that Chemotherapy is probably the commonest reason I see people with blood clots. 60% of my clinical practice are patients whose blood clots have been brought on by chemo. Now, I think this is a very difficult time for patients. On average, most 53% of the people who get blood clots will do so within the first three months of being diagnosed with cancer. And I recognise it's a very difficult time for people. They've been told that they have cancer. Clearly, this is a very distressing time. And then they may get a blood clot within those first three months. And they will find that incredibly distressing as well. Now, I think what I'd like to suggest to you is actually blood clots are a normal part of the cancer journey. And you're likely to read all sorts of frightening things if you go on the Internet. And I can't stop you from doing that. But I want to put it in context that blood clots are a very well recognized phenomenon or process, part of the cancer journey. And we have very good medicines which are available to treat them. Now, why do we need to treat them? Why do we take them seriously? Well, first, let me tell you about blood clots. The place where a blood clot will form most commonly is in the legs. That's because gravity takes your blood to your legs. It's more likely to sludge there. If you're not moving around, blood can pool in your legs and you're more likely to form a clot. Now, in many people, there are no symptoms at all in that leg. Um, some people just get a pain, perhaps in the calf. Other people may get swelling. Some people may have pain, um, swelling and redness. Now that clot itself, apart from being uncomfortable, isn't too much of a problem unless it gets bigger and a piece of clot breaks down and goes on to the lungs. Now that is called a pulmonary embolus. Pulmonary meaning lung, embolus, clot which has lodged in the lung. Now once again, a small clot doesn't seem to be a problem, but a big clot could obstruct or slow down blood flow through your lungs, slow down the amount of oxygen that you're able to carry around the body. So people will feel breathless. They may cough up blood. They may have chest pain. So there's a whole spectrum of symptoms going from no symptoms at all, right across to being incredibly unwell and a small proportion of people who have blood clots, that blood clot can be fatal. Now, I'm not saying that to frighten you. 
I'm just saying that because it is a rarity, you know, I'm glad to say, but it does illustrate the importance of getting treated. Now, the difference between people who have cancer and get a blood clot compared to someone who maybe had a blood clot because of an operation is that the cancer is still present there or they're still having chemotherapy. So the risk of clots continues rather than it just being a one-off blip. So therefore it's important we treat these blood clots and we treat them by giving an anticoagulant. Now what that is, is it's um, something which slows down, stops to a degree the clotting system. Doesn't stop it completely, but it slows it right down. So let's be clear, this medicine doesn't break the clot down. It just stops the body from forming more abnormal clot. And during that time, it allows the body to break down that clot using its own natural reabsorbing system. The other thing it does is whatever clot is there, it will stabilize it, make it less likely to break off and go to other places. And then as once you've stabilized that clot and allowed the body to reabsorb it over time, you would also want to remain on this anticoagulant, this blood thinner, to prevent you from getting other clots. Now this is particularly important in people who still have ongoing active cancer. This is particularly important in people who continue to have chemotherapy because that will increase the risk of clots. So what anticoagulants are there? What medicines are there? The majority of people will be on an injection of a medicine which the, the class is called a low molecular weight heparin. There are various different types of this. They are a similar class of medicine. They are given as an injection usually once a day under the skin. Now, why has this been the most commonly used blood thinner? Well, quite simply because at the time it was brought out, it had the strongest evidence of working well. It was much better at preventing people getting recurrent blood clots. Not only that, it didn't interfere with your treatment. So if you were on chemotherapy, it didn't stop you having the chemotherapy. The medicine didn't interact with your chemotherapy. The downside, of course, is that it is an injection. And I just want to quickly talk about this. Now, there are um, other videos talking about self-injecting. I just want to give you my perspective in the context of a cancer journey. First of all, the injections often they will say you should just do it under the belly button an inch below the navel now if you're on this injection for several months you're going to run out of space so my advice is anywhere that you can pinch fat is fair game so around the belly even going around the love handles some people suggest the top of the thighs from my experience my patients actually find that you know harder and also, because you've got some big muscles under the thighs, you've got to be quite careful. But I'd say if you can pinch fat, lift it away and inject, that is the best thing to do. Now, a couple of things you need to know are normal. People do often get bruises. There are ways to try and minimise this, injecting more slowly, pressing hard for a couple of minutes after. But if you get a bruise, that is not abnormal. The other thing that is not abnormal is getting a lump in an area where you have injected. Often a bruise will heal with scar tissue or fibrous tissue and people will report feeling lumps under the skin. Now the reason I'm pointing this out to you is that when you are going through a cancer journey you're often very worried about any signs that the cancer isn't responding to treatment. And if you start finding lumps under your skin and no one's warned you about this, your first thought may be, oh my gosh, is this cancer? Are these secondaries? I want to reassure you that if these are in areas where you've been injecting, it is most likely that this is an area of scar tissue. 
The other reason it's important to know this is because you mustn't inject into those because they will blinking well hurt. So try and avoid those and you'll find that they will slowly be reabsorbed back into the body. Now, there are other medicines out there which are on the market and they're being used more commonly. These are called direct acting oral anticoagulants or DOACs for short, that's spelled D-O-A-C-S. Once again, there are various types out there. Um, some of them are taken once a day as a tablet, others are taken twice a day. Over the last couple of years, we have seen studies, excuse me, I've got to move, I've got a dead leg, hang on. So over the, over the last couple of years, we've seen studies performed which have shown that these medicines work as well as the injections in treating people with cancer associated blood clots. But that is only for a certain proportion of patients. They work very well in most cancers, but you have to be careful in people who have upper gastrointestinal cancers. So I'm talking about people with cancers of the gullet or esophagus. And also, there is some suggestion that people with urothelial cancers, so I'm talking about cancers of the bladder and cancers of the ureter, which is the tube coming out of the kidney, there may be an increased risk of bleeding for some of these tablets. The other thing is these tablets can interact with more medicines than the injections. And this area is quite complex and is something that your doctor and your pharmacist would need to look at and advise whether or not the tablets could be taken or not. So it's not a straightforward thing of a choice between an injection or a tablet. This needs to be far more individualized and will be considered against various things, including what sort of cancer you have, what treatments you are having for your cancer, and what your blood tests look like, particularly with respect to your kidney tests and your liver tests. How long are you going to be anticoagulated for? Well, this once again depends on the status of your cancer. As a rule, the guidelines say that you should be on blood thinners anticoagulated for a minimum of six months. That's for most blood clots. Now, if you still have ongoing active cancer or you are receiving further anti-cancer treatments so not just chemotherapy but immunotherapies targeted anti-cancer therapies if you're continuing on these sort of cancer treatments the risk factors that make your blood more sticky are still there and it would make sense that you should remain on a blood thinner once again needs to be discussed with your doctors as to which blood thinner thinner would be best now, with all blood thinners, there are side effects you have to be wary of. The first one is anything that thins your blood. It means that if you were to cut yourself or injure yourself, you'd be likely to bleed longer. It would take longer for a clot or a scab to form. So you have to be slightly careful with lifestyle modifications. Certainly, if you're someone who's into contact sports or is into anything which causes trauma to themselves, you have to be very careful. You have to be mindful that there is a slightly increased risk of bleeding. So if you were to be getting nosebleeds or coughing up blood or passing blood in the urine or passing blood from the bowel, you would need to seek medical attention quickly. The other thing that I think is very important is that as much as your cancer treatment is being decided individually for you based on many factors as to what sort of cancer it is, where it is, what your scans show, likewise the treatment of your clot should be individualized as best as possible. Now you may be seen initially by a blood clot specialist nurse or even a blood a hematologist who has an interest in thrombosis but it's important to make sure that the treatment for the clot that you're getting is individualized to you. Finally, I think it's important to recognize that 
you know, if you're watching this as a patient or as a carer, you know, my heart goes out to you. You have clearly been having a pretty rough time at the moment with the treatment of your cancer um, and then to have the blood clot. It is normal to be distressed by this. It is normal to feel frightened by this. But I just want to do my best to reassure you and say that the treatments we have have been used for many years, been shown to be very safe and very effective. I just want you to make sure that you take clots seriously. You take the medicines as you are told. You don't stop them unless given advice. And you make sure that if you change any of your medicines, the doctors and the pharmacists are aware that you are on blood thinners. Finally, just because you have had a clot and just because you're on blood thinners doesn't mean that you can't travel. Now, at the time of making this video, none of us can travel because we're all in lockdown because of COVID-19. But many patients that I see will have come to the end of their anti-cancer treatments, but are still on blood thinners and wonder whether they're allowed to travel. Certainly being on blood thinners doesn't stop you from that. Being on the injections doesn't stop you from that either. I would ask, um, I would suggest that you ask your doctor for a letter just allowing you to take your injections, if you're on injections, with you in your hand luggage. It's best to take them in the hand luggage than put them in the cargo hold because it gets a bit too cold there and can make the medicine inactive. But I think the thing to do is to try and get into a routine of taking your medicines so it becomes part of your normal daily routine. And then you can live with blood clots, you can carry on with your life and face this cancer journey as best as you can. I hope this video has been helpful. Um, you know, thank you for watching it. And please keep looking on the website with Thrombosis UK and all the other resources we have. Thank you.